This is Grace Notes. I'm Alan Button, and our guest today is Dr. Mike Rowland. Mike is a retired surgeon and has led a very varied life uh, now into grass-fed beef, and we'll talk more about that uh, here shortly. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Tell you what, Mike, let's start, since uh, your history uh, connects from one event to another, with uh, where you grew up and uh, what that was about, and tell us about your education. Well, I grew up in Bath, New York. It's uh, South Central New York State in the foothills, pretty much like we are right here in North Carolina. That's the same general area of New York State called the Finger Lakes area. A bunch of Finger Lakes there. We were close to Cuca Lake. Cayuga is where Ithaca and Cornell University was where I went to undergraduate school. And it was just a small community, about 5,000 people, a lot like Southern Pines was when we first moved here in 1980. And I did a lot of gardening, had chickens, and worked at a greenhouse, and did a lot of agricultural-related things. Helped this was in Bath, farms. in Bath you're talking right. about. You uh, ended up majoring at Cornell in what? I went there to study agriculture, specifically ag economics, and ended up realizing that my dream of becoming a farmer and owning a farm and running a farm were... Uh, basically unachievable based on my financial background and the huge costs that were involved in achieving something like that. So you shifted gears. Right. I ended up getting a a dream and a message one night uh, that I believe was from God that uh, told me that if I I would become a general surgeon that I'd get my farm. Uh (laughs) And it happened. Having been at Cornell, what year did you graduate there? 1969. That was a very very significant year in the history of Cornell and the nation generally. Right. The or, riots, they took over the university, and uh, we were trying to have classes in light of the, the university takeover, but then yeah. ended up affecting a lot of my future because they messed up college transcripts of the students at the administrative offices. and The takeover was of the main administration building, is that well, right? It was the student union and the administration building, uh-huh. uh, among others. And uh, those messed up transcripts messed up my transition into medical training by several years until we figured out that they were sending somebody else's transcripts to the medical schools under my name. Oh, boy. And that student uh, hadn't done quite as well as you had, is that right? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but you ended up uh, in medical school in Buffalo? Yes, I did. But after a side trip for active duty training for the Army National Guard. I was going to say that was a heavy time period with respect to the Vietnam War. That had some impact on you. Right. And as I watched the 10-part series on the Vietnam War last fall, and it was very emotional. I mean, I I did a lot of crying Uh listening to things that happened back then. But it was a very educational program because it gave all different perspectives on all the different events and uh, was unlike any program that I've seen uh, historical because it gave so many different points of view of, of all the different factors that occurred then. I'd certainly encourage anybody that lived through that area to look at it because I think it would help them understand what they went through. What was your connection with the military? I ended up in an Army National Guard unit in Buffalo. Ultimately, it started off as a combat engineer unit, and then I went to officer basic training and uh, became an officer and got into a medical unit, and I stayed in that medical unit as an officer for 11 years. And at some point, you made your way to North Carolina? in 1980. But I actually started coming down here in 77 to try and locate the area that I wanted to settle in and establish my practice because in those days, the doctor went someplace and hung a shield and spent their life there. Nowadays, doctors move every four or five years. Uh, Uh It's a different environment today than it was back in 1970 and 80. And you met somebody named Judy that was, tell tell uh, us about that, because uh, that relates to this first song that you've oh, identified. Yes, uh, she worked in the operating room, one of the assistants at surgery in our general surgery room for a number of years. And uh, after my wife at the time left, after we'd known each other for four or five years, we went out on a date and she said she broke all her rules to go out with me. She didn't ever, ever want to marry a doctor or a surgeon, didn't want to marry anybody that had been married before, didn't want to marry anybody that had kids <laughs> uh, but uh, her relatives said, well, you're just going out on a date. You don't have to marry him. <laughs> but uh, we found out that we had a, an amazing amount of things in common. It uh, just clicked. Tell us about this Kenny Rogers song that you've identified well, as, and, as, and that you connect with your wife. As historically reports, it came out 10 years before I really 
was aware of it, but when we were dating, we happened to hear it together, and I was just thinking how appropriate it was for she and I and the way I felt about things, and so we had it as one of our songs at our wedding. Very good. Let's hear the song, Lady, by Kenny Rogers. Lady, I'm your knight. That was Lady by Kenny Rogers. If you're just joining us, our guest today is Mike Rowland. Mike is a retired surgeon and now in a, an entirely different line of work. And Mike, maybe you could pick up by telling us how you and your wife got into grass-fed beef. The card that you gave me identifies you as farm manager. And I see that uh, your name and your wife's name are on the card, and you describe it as our heaven on earth. Yes, I we ended up buying this 50-acre farm about midway between Pinehurst and Carthage in mid-90s uh, because uh, we had our zoning changed, our home in Southern Pines, where we were going to have our horses come. We had to find another place to live. Uh-huh. But after we got settled there and got our pasture started and uh, got an irrigation system set up, we had a significant drought, and I believe it was 99, and her middle brother was raising cattle and had cattle that he couldn't feed and couldn't get hay for, and uh, the cows were pregnant, and you couldn't give them away. And uh, we took a half a dozen on our farm for several months to tide them over until his pastures recovered in the fall. In the meantime, they had their calves, and uh, in the fall, when the time came, he took his cows back home, and we kept the calves. That was our payment for helping him salvage his cows, and uh, just grew from there. <laughs> uh-huh. Something I didn't know much about before, but I've had quite an education for and learning. Well, as you were telling us earlier, uh, you grew up with kind of an agricultural bent right from the beginning. And with your science background, no doubt that has been a significant help to you in pulling it all together. It's interesting because in my nutrition lectures, I talk about a gentleman named uh, William Albrecht, who was at the University of Missouri back in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And uh, he was an amazing, he was probably one of the most brilliant people And there was one journal for the United States for agronomy and plants, and he was the editor-in-chief of that. And at that time, back in the 40s and 50s, uh, there was only one journal for veterinary medicine, and he was the editor-in-chief of that. So he really understood animal physiology and nutrition, and he understood soil and plants. And actually, he developed most of the tests that we use to analyze the nutrients in the soil, the nitrogen and the phosphate and the potassium and the magnesium. He developed all those tests back in the 30s and 40s, and he was actually using them to analyze plant tissues, which we think of it as a new thing today, but he was doing it back then. He was analyzing food for nutrient value, and he was noting that nutrients were falling off. And anyway, he he had one foot in soil and plants and another foot in animal science and physiology, and he made a prediction because what was going on then that we would develop an epidemic among humans and with obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, mental illness, because of what was going on with the developing progressive deficiencies of nutrients in the soil and how it's affecting our plants, our food, and our health. And That reminds me, one of our clients here at the station talks about how we are what they eat. You know, we've heard the line, you are what you eat, we are what they eat, they say. That's very true. That's why my grass-fed beef that's eating forages that's grown on soils that have been rejuvenated and balanced, uh, they're going to have higher nutrient density than other grass-fed beef. Tell us about the distinction between grass-fed beef and grain-fed beef. It's been demonstrated over and over again where they've taken the meat samples and analyzed it in labs, and they've shown that the grain-finished beef that is the common meat that's available in grocery stores, it's fed out west in big feedlots, that it has high omega-6 fatty acids, which are the ones that are bad for your heart, and has very few omega-3s, which are the good ones, whereas grass-finished beef has lots of omega-3s, more like salmon, and very little of the omega-6, the bad ones. And it's interesting, if you look at advice for diets, most people are aware that for several decades, it's been advised not to eat red meat, but it's not the red meat that's bad. It's grain-fed red meat. And in fact, more of the nutritional advisors are revising their advice now for the Mediterranean diet. It used to be, do not eat red meat. Now the Mediterranean diet says, grass-fed beef is okay because the nutritional profile, that the high omega-3s and the low omega-6. 
Interesting. Tie together for us, if you would, Mike, sort of your life theme or themes. Uh, make the connection for us, moving from uh, surgery to nutrition and grass-fed beef. and <laughs> It's part of the circle of life. That's where I started off, and I've gotten <laughs> back there. And the reason I got back there is because I did what I understood I was supposed to do is become a general surgeon. And now that I'm back on the farm, I'm learning a lot of new things. I continue to take uh, educational programs and do a lot of reading, and I continue to uh, feel like I'm guided to do things to help other people. Uh, nutritionally, giving advice about how to eat to be healthy and become healthy and stay healthy and how to raise animals to be healthy and how to help some of the local small farmers to uh, find a different way to do what they're doing. Again, the old Einstein insanity definition continue to do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different results, trying to educate the local beef farmers that if they raise their cattle two years to harvest age and size and direct sell them to the public, uh, they can make three times or more as much money as by selling calves at the stockyard that go out west and get poisoned and come back to poison us. Picking up on this proposition that there is uh, a life theme here, tell us about this next song that you've identified, I Love You Just the Way You Are by Billy Joel. It just... Uh, is a tribute again to my wife and uh, the fact that so many people meet somebody and they'll marry somebody and they think, I'm going to marry him and then I'm going to change him. <laughs> but that clearly wasn't necessary with my wife. Let's hear the song. This one goes out to Judy. I Love You Just the Way You Are by Billy Joel. That was Billy Joel's I Love You Just the Way You Are. Our guest today is Mike Rowland. Mike, uh, we've been talking about grass-fed beef and nutrition and a number of other things, of course, as well. Uh, it's hard for me, and I expect many in, in our audience, to think about beef and the state of the industry without considering the current situation with respect to Chinese tariffs. Does that have any impact on what you do or uh, what you not, talk to not people for about? Us. Not for us. Alan. We're uh, strictly small scale. For the most part, we're selling to people that we know and that know us. I've got a number of people from the hospital that know me from the hospital and know my reputation for doing things right, and uh, they buy beef from me. I've got a large number of master gardeners. I went through their training program when I retired from surgery because it had been so many years since I'd been active in it. And there's a lot that's changed in horticulture and soil science since I was at Cornell. And one of the places we've got a sign up now is at John Blue's Highlander Produce Stand on 22. And uh, I expect we're going to be getting a lot of people that are interested in buying fresh vegetables from him that will be interested in buying some fresh beef from us. But the China issue really doesn't impact us at all. Because exporting is not your model. You, uh... no, we're, we're local food. If you go to the grocery store and buy some beef, the money you pay, most of that money just zips out of North Carolina, out of the East Coast, and goes out West. Very little of it stays here. Whereas if you buy some of our grass-fed beef, it has the multiplier effect that local economy things have. To support local businesses has a major multiplier effect, as anybody with economic experience and knowledge is aware. And one of the reasons I'm doing it with the other farms is because it's a way to help those farms become profitable and to encourage the next generation to realize that they can make a living, make some money with direct marketing of grass-fed beef, and, and maybe they will keep the family farm going instead of letting it become a, a big development. What kind of reception have you gotten from local farmers? A lot of resistance, and uh, it's difficult because most of the folks have grown up on farms that are multi-generational, and the beef part of farming is something that's been done in a certain way for generations, and it's hard to get them to change. They have their calves, and they sell a few calves every year at the stockyard, and they get some money for that, and uh, they are not appreciating that the amount they're getting every year keeps going down and down and down. Uh -huh. but, uh, but it's just what they're done. It's what they're comfortable with and familiar with. And even when they understand it and agree to it, there's a two-year delay from when they agree to start raising some animals for two years instead of selling them at six months. There's a loss of income and cash flow to do that. And then they have to get them sold. And since I've been doing it for 16 plus years, I have a lot of repeat customers and kind of takes care of itself. But somebody starting off fresh, you know, they have to find new customers, uh, de novo, and that's not easy. 
For those of us and in our audience who are not farmers, it occurs to me that we've got Earth Day on Sunday, and much of what you are talking about has some bearing on the themes and the underlying purposes of Earth Day. You got anything you'd like to say about that? And we recycle, we compost. I was a member of the board for the state North Carolina Compost Council. Uh, I started the Moore County Compost Council. We're into recycling. Very little leaves our farm. We've got probably the smallest carbon footprint in the county. We make 110% of our electricity. We uh, even have a plug-in electric car that gets its energy off of our roof. uh, Uh Solar panels? Yeah. And we heat with uh, wood from dead oak trees that get knocked down by storms. We lost 12 oak trees at Matthew a year and a half ago, Uh and we're still burning them up. But uh, we have a number of ecological things. Uh, Our soil organic matter used to be uh, about 1%. Now it's about 6%. And my son was just talking. He wished there was a way we could save that two and three quarter inches of rain that we had. (laughs) And I told him, I said, uh, now that my soil organic matter is about 6%, I'm actually stockpiling about 100,000 plus gallons per acre of rainwater in my pastures because the 6% organic matter can store that much in the top foot of soil, whereas before it could only store uh, one-sixth of that. All the things we're doing are designed to be more earth-friendly, and I'm a strong supporter and proponent for Earth Day. When I hear you talk, I I hear we a lot, W-E. And I gather you're talking again about your wife, among others. She's she's very involved. We spent the day yesterday putting a bunch of uh, flowers, or spent the weekend actually, putting a bunch of flowers and plants around the property and uh, getting some of our finished compost to refill some of the plant pots that uh, we were planting into. She's uh, all in. Tell us about this third song that you've identified, Through the Years by Kenny Rogers. It uh, really tells the story very, very well of uh, how I feel about my wife, Judy. It says it all for me. (laughs) I guess we can leave it there. Mike, it's been a real treat to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the opportunity. If people would like more information on what you do or what you have to say in your lectures or anything like that, is there a place they can go? Absolutely. For the website, it, it has not only the information about buying grass-fed beef, it has information about the nutritional value of the beef. It has uh, my nutritional lectures on there. It has information about improving your uh, soil. It has a bunch of photographs of our farm and uh, has a PowerPoint on uh, the nutrition lectures. It has a big, long bibliography with hyperlinks. If you see something in my uh, Circle of Life uh, nutrition lecture that you question, you can go to the bibliography, find the article, and click on it on your computer, and it'll take you to the full article where you can read at your heart's content about all the uh, validations and research that's been done to document what I've said. So you're not making this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and people have been saying what I'm saying. They've been saying it for decades, but uh, unfortunately people, and particularly the medical profession, has not been listening. What is that web address? Moregrassfedbeef.com. It's M-O-O-R-E-G-R-A-S-S-F-E-D, beef, B-E-E-F.com. More as in Moore County. Correct. Very good. Well, let's hear the song. Again, Mike uh, talking about his wife, Judy, and what they do together. Through the Years by Kenny Rogers. You've been listening to Grace Notes, a special program here on Life 103.1 featuring people who may be relatively unknown, but who meet life's challenges in ways that brighten the lives of those around them. Our producer is Christina Dolan. I'm Alan Button, and we invite you to join all of us here at the station again next Friday at 530 for Grace Notes on Life 103.1.